Uh, I was trying to solve these questions from the practice uh, package for <clears throat> our final exam in pre-calculus 12. All right, so here we have a rational function. I can say it's rational because it's a ratio. Uh, it's a sum value divided by some other value. And that's the first five letters in the word. Rational is a ratio. All right, uh, so to get an idea about what a sketch of a rational function looks like, uh, I want to remind you that it's kind of defined by vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes. And those are going to help us get an idea about the shape of this graph. All right. So uh, we're going to go one step at a time, and we're going to just try and figure out some values of our graph, and we'll sketch them when we figure them out. And the more we test, the more this is going to all come together in some sort of shape. All right. So uh, part one, I'm going to call it step A because that's one of the things we're asked for, which is the x-intercepts. So to make, find x-intercepts, we're going to make y zero, and then we are going to solve for x. All right. Now, first step in an equation like this is we should probably get rid of the denominator, so we're going to multiply both sides by the denominator. And so we'll multiply both sides by x minus 3 and x plus 1. And when I multiply 0 by all that stuff, it just becomes 0. So on the left-hand side, actually, it uh, remains 0. On the right-hand side, it becomes quite simple. And it looks like the x-intercepts are going to be the values x is 2 and x is negative 2. So I might start by just sketching that. Now, keyword here is sketch. You can use graph paper if you like. But we don't need tons of precision. We just need to know what's important. And we need to graph those parts. All right, so we got two x-intercepts. Great. Uh, maybe next I'll find the y-intercept. Uh, all right, so uh, y-intercept, we're going to plug in 0 for x. So we're going to say z y is equal to, and when x minus 2, I plug in a 0 there. That just becomes a negative 2. And this guy just becomes positive 2. And then we get negative 3 and 1 on the bottom, which multiply together to give negative 3, but I'll write out the step anyhow. So it's going to give us negative 4 on the top and negative 3 on the bottom. So the y-intercept is at 4 thirds. So I'm going to draw 1 here. It's going to be 3 thirds, or 1 uh, unit up, and 1 more third to get to 4 thirds there. There's our y-intercept. All right. So next... We're going to check to see if there are any holes. And to remind you, we can see if there are holes if there is a factor on the bottom that is the same as a factor on the top. And we're going to see in question 11, we're going to see some holes. But there are none in this case. So we have to skip on to part D. Uh, now, part D, this is really what defines our function here. We're going to try and find any vertical asymptotes. I almost forgot how to spell vertical for a second there. All right. So to set, find vertical asymptotes, what we're really looking for are domain restrictions. We know that in a rational function, the values on the bottom, well, they can't, when all is said and done, be equal to zero. Because that would mean we're dividing by zero, and dividing by zero is one of the cardinal no-nos of math. We can't divide by zero. It uh, doesn't make sense as a concept. So what we're really looking for is making sure that this denominator does not equal zero. So I can actually make that a statement if I want. Uh, I guess I say x minus 3 times x plus 1 can't equal zero. And that means, well, I can say, well, x then can't be 3, because if I put 3 in for x, it makes it all zero. And also, x can't be 1. And these are two restrictions. These are domain restrictions. And these domain restrictions tell us our vertical asymptotes. So they tell us we're going to have asymptotes. We're going to have vertical asymptotes at x equals 3 and x equals 1, which are the values that our graph can't have. 
and that's what an asymptote is. It's not really part of the shape itself, it's really a boundary of the shape. Okay, and so that's going to mean we're going to have one value, oh wait, no, that should be negative one. Yeah, and uh, three. Okay, so let me use blue here, uh, green. Uh, all right, I'll put an asymptote here. And then we have an asymptote at x equals negative 1. And we always like to label our asymptotes x equals 3. So those are parts of our graph that... Uh, <clears throat> um, our graph won't be able to reach directly. All right, so we're getting there. Uh, it may not look like it, but we kind of are. All right, uh, so let's move on. Uh, so next cut question is we got to decide what case is this now when we learned this the first time what we we learned is there's one two three different kinds of cases when it can, comes to considering uh, horizontal asymptotes we have a case where uh, the um, if we have the radical function for n of x over m of x I think we use M or D, to be honest. I actually, I'm going to just double, double check. I would like to be consistent. Oh, we did use M. Okay. Uh, great. So we have a case where maybe the uh, degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. Okay. Uh, and so that would be, for example, something like uh, X over X plus 1. And to remind you, that would mean there would be a horizontal asymptote at x equals 0. And that's not because of any values in particular here, but rather just a general principle that the degree on the top of this uh, function, actually the degrees are the same now that I look at it, so let's try to make this uh, x squared plus 1. So that's an example there. And I've written it kind of small, so I'll try and... Uh, well, I'm writing kind of small because... I'm writing kind of small because this isn't actually the stuff we care about. Uh, I'm just reminding you of some rules. The next possibility is that our numerator's um, degree is equal to the denominator's degree. Um, I think we actually just use m and n, actually. So we had a polynomial on the top, polynomial on the bottom. We called n the degree of the top, and m the degree of the bottom. That's coming back to me now. And the last possibility is that our degree on the top is greater than our degree on the bottom. Now, if this is the case, our degrees are the same. Say you have, for example, uh, x plus 1 over x minus 2. There's a horizontal asymptote at uh, the ratio of the leading coefficients. Oh, sorry, a horizontal asymptote would have been y equals 0. So let's make this maybe a little bit more interesting here. I'll make that actually a 3x minus 2. And so for this example, it would be a horizontal asymptote, for example, at y equals 1 third. Because we have a 1 here, we have a 3 here, and we divide them to find the horizontal asymptote. And lastly, we have a case where m the degree on the top is greater than the degree on the bottom, and that's where we're going to have to do some long division to find a, an oblique asymptote. All right. So uh, in this case, one of these three cases is applicable, and it is the second case. This is a second-degree polynomial on the top and a second-degree polynomial on the bottom. So this is... Uh, So this is our second case. We have a, a, a degree, dig, oh my god, I can't even write. Degree two polynomial on the top and degree two polynomial on the bottom. So we would say m equals n. And then we need to find the ratio of the leading coefficients. So to do that, I'm going to look at the coefficients of each of these terms. So, so one there, and a one there, and a one there, and a one there. 
So I'm going to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1 times 1 over 1 times 1, which is 1 over 1, or 1. So that means that we'll have a horizontal asymptote. And that's at y equals 1. OK. So now I'm going to zoom out a little bit. I've kind of gone ahead and filled the page. So now we have the skeleton of our graph. And we may have some ideas about how it's going to look. And we may be a little uncertain. And that level of certainty is going to be very individual. And if you guys remember in this unit, some people would be pretty cavalier about drawing the rest of the graph, even from this point. And others would like to find many, many different other points by, say, you making a table of values and testing different values of x and seeing what y is spit out. So let's make a table of values for the last step here. So I'm going to say step f. We'll make a table of values. And I'll just choose some x's and y's, and hopefully that will help to fill in the blanks as to what's going on here. All right, uh, so I think maybe I want to try, I have a hypothesis. This graph is probably going to be approaching both of these asymptotes in this way. But maybe to confirm that, I'll try uh, an x is negative 1, 2, 3. And let's see what I get here. I'm going to plug in negative 3 here, so it'll be negative 5 times negative 1 over uh, negative 3 minus 3 is negative 6 times negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2. And that's going to give me 5 twelfths. Is that right? Did I do something wrong there? Oh, yeah. OK. So that means at ne when x is negative 3, my value for y is going to be a little bit bigger than 0, but not as big as 1, not even as big as half. So it'll be somewhere like there. All right, and that kind of confirms my hypothesis. If I wasn't sure, I might try another point, like negative 2 and a half. But actually, I'm pretty sure there. But you're going to have to choose how many of those points you're going to plug in to be confident in this shape. All right, and in between here, oh, maybe I have a hypothesis that's going to look something like this. It's going to sneak down. Um, so maybe I'll try x is negative a half. I think it's going to give me a very y big y value. So let's say x is negative half. All right, so that's going to give me negative half minus 2. So it's like negative 2.5. Uh, negative half plus 2, so it's going to give me positive 1.5. Negative half minus 3 is going to be negative 3.5. And negative half plus 1 is actually going to give me a half. All right, uh, so we're going to get a positive number. Um, and I think I might need a calculator for this. So, uh, all right, so let's plug this guy in. I, I know it's going to be, those negatives are going to cancel out, so I'm not even going to type them in. 2.5 times 1.5 equals, divide that by 3.5 equals, divide that by 0.5. So I should get a value actually at 2.414. So when x is negative a half, y is 2 and a quarter. So I think I was right that our graph probably is going to be approaching this y asymptote, or vertical asymptote, because that's kind of what rational functions do. They approach asymptotes. In fact, that's kind of the definition of asymptotes, is that they're always approached by our graph. Our graphs need something to approach, and that's what asymptotes are. Or at least that's one way to define them. All right. So lastly, I may want to test a point out here, because I think it's actually probably going to be like this, because I've seen a few graphs that are sort of like this, but it might be down here. Could be wrong. Could be something weird about it. So maybe we'll test the point. We've got one, two, three. So maybe we'll choose four. What happens when x is four? So it looks like when x is 4, I'm going to plug in 4 and get 2 times 2 plus, or 4 plus 2 is 6, over 2 minus 3 is negative 1, times 6, negative 1, times 
uh, 2 plus 1, so that's 3. That's going to be 12 over negative 3. Wait, really? No, that's positive 1. Okay, 12 over 3, which is 4. Okay, so when x is 4, that, something about that sounds a little high. I was really expecting something a little bit closer to uh, the number 2, maybe. Uh, I just want to double check my math there to make sure I didn't muck, muck anything up. 4 minus 2 is 2. Correct. 4 plus 2 is 6. Okay. 4 minus 3 is 1. And 4 plus 1 is 5. Right. There we go. Okay. So now we're going to get 12 over 5. Which is, okay, a little bit better. It's like 2 and then a little bit more. It's like 2.4. All right, so I'm going to put a point here at 2.4. Okay, and that actually confirms that we're going to be above this asymptote for me. And I think I kind of get an idea what it's going to look like here. But again, you're going to need to choose how many points you need to be convinced that this is the shape that this graph is going to make. All right. <clears throat> so as you can see, these questions can be pretty beefy. Uh, and that's a fine picture of our graph. You can test that on Desmos if you like. Prove me wrong. All right. Last question of this type, which is a rational function. Okay. Now, hopefully this will go a little bit quicker because we reviewed a few of the concepts in question 10. Uh, there is obviously a very uh, specific concept that makes this one unique. In fact, I guess there's two. One's going to involve long division. Uh, all right. So uh, let's start with the x-intercepts. We're going to set y equal to zero. Uh, 0 equals x plus 3 times x minus 1 times x minus 4. And wait a second. That's not going to be an x-intercept, is it? Well, wait, hang on. How does the math work here? Okay. So the first thing to recognize is there's actually a factor on the top that is also a factor on the bottom. So we're going to get some holes. This is going to tell us there's a hole at x equals 1. So that's the first thing we're going to need to know. So what this really is going to look like, we could simplify this whole graph to be really something more like y is x plus 3 times x minus 4 over x minus 3 and, in addition, x can't be 1, and there will be a hole in that position. So that's how this graph simplifies. Okay, uh, so we should probably consider those holes before we start on the x-intercepts, because otherwise we would have found an x-intercept of 1, but actually that's not going to be part of our graph, because we don't have an x at 1. All right. So for the, our x-intercepts, again, we'll set y equal to 0. But now we're just going to use these two values, x plus 3 times x minus 4. Of course, we have x minus 3 on the bottom, and then we're multiplying by that x minus 3 afterwards. So that cancels it out. And that really gives us x-intercepts at uh, x equals negative 3 and x equals 4. So that's the first thing we might sketch. Looks like this graph's going to be a little bit more spread out than the last one. I'm going to point at negative 3 and point at 1, 2, 3, 4. Good. All right. And then we'll move on. We'll find a uh, y-intercept. Why not? So make a y-intercept. We'll say, OK, y is equal to. We'll plug in 0 for x for all of these guys. And so I can get it at uh, 3, negative 4, and negative 3 on the bottom. OK. Uh, and so I get negative 12 divided by negative 3, which is 4. So we're going to have a y-intercept at 4. Wait, what? Okay, right. Y intercept at 4. All right. So that means uh, we can graph that guy as well. 1, 2, 3, 4. Again, it's just a sketch, so we don't need to worry too much about the detail here. 
All right. Next, we're going to have vertical asymptotes. All right, we're going to be looking on the, in the denominator here. So I'm going to rewrite our function here. y equals x plus 3, x minus 4, x minus 3 is our simplified version of our function, and x can't be 1. All right. Just focus again there. Okay, so to find our vertical asymptotes, which is part D, vertical asymptotes, uh, that means that uh, our x value, we're going to set our denominator, my x minus 3 not equal to 0, which is going to say, therefore, that x can't be 3. And that tells us we have a vertical asymptote at the value x equals 3. So we're going to draw a vertical asymptote here at x equals 3. So next we're on to our end behavior. What's the situation here? Well, it looks like this is a situation where we have a degree 2 polynomial on the top of our function, degree 2, and a degree 1 polynomial on the bottom. And so what that tells us is that this is the case where our... Oh, wait. Shoot, did we say M? I'm really trying to... It's been a while since I've thought about which letters we used uh, for this, so I'm actually going to just go back to our notes and just double check that we're using the uh, notation M. It's great. Okay, so actually we're calling M the top. And this is a case where, case four, three, this is where our M is greater than N. And I'm actually going to go back try and be a little more consistent here. I think we're using m for the degree of the top and n for the degree of the bottom. So this is where uh, m is less than n. I'll write that m. Mm -hmm. And then this is the case where m is greater than n. Okay. All right. Uh, so that means we're going to have to do, and specifically, actually, it means that m is the same thing as the n plus 1. That's actually, I think, how we defined step 3. So this means is we're going to have to do some long division. But luckily, when we do long division of this uh, rational function, it's not that hairy. There's not too much to it. Uh, okay. Oh, I should expand this guy, I guess. So we got x squared. Uh, 3x minus 4x is going to be negative x. And then 3 times negative 4 is negative 12. All right. So then we're going to say how many times is x going to x squared? It goes in once. I'm going to multiply x and negative 3 by x. So it's going to give us x squared minus 3x. We'll subtract all those guys. And that's going to give us a positive 2x, I think, yeah. A negative 1 plus 3, yeah. And then minus 12. All right, then we say how many times is x going to net 2x? It's going to go in positive 2 times. We're starting to get an idea of what our graph is going to look like. Our asymptote is going to be a, an oblique asymptote with a slope of 1 and a horizontal asymptote, pardon me, and a y-intercept of 2. So we'll just uh, run the numbers here. I'll multiply 2 by both of these guys. I get 2x minus 6 take these guys away, and I get a remainder that I don't really care about of negative 6. And remainders are okay when we're doing this stuff, because uh, nobody said that uh, x minus 3 was a factor. In fact, it couldn't be, or else it would result in a hole. All right. So this means we're going to get uh, an asymptote, an oblique asymptote, at y equals x plus 2. So I'm going to draw that one in. So it's going to be a line like this. It's going to start at y equals 2 for on a y-intercept. We're going to rise 1 and run 1, rise 1 and run 1, rise 1 and run 1, 
Rise down negative one and run negative one. Rise negative one, run negative one. Rise negative one, run negative one. And it looks something like this. Okay. And we know where there's some parts that are going to be up going appro approaching this graph like so, and some parts that are going to be approaching this graph like so. So lastly, we may want to test a few points. Let's make a table of values. And this is our individual. Uh, everybody can choose a different number of table uh, values for x of test. Uh, and uh, you might choose none. You may have an idea what this is going to look like because you know these asymptotes have to get approached. I'm going to just double check here. Uh, I'm going to plug in x is, uh, let's say, 2. And, oh, yeah, right, okay. Uh, so that's going to give us a 2 plus 3 is 5 times 2 minus 4 is negative 2. So it's going to have 5 times negative 2, which is going to be negative 10. And uh, 2 minus 3 is negative 1. So negative 10 or negative 1, which is going to be 10. So when x is 2, y is actually going to be up here at 10. All right, so I kind of have an idea it's going to look like this. However, let's not forget, there is a hole at x is 1. So there's a hole right there. All right, there's our graph. And then we're going to have something down here. It's probably going to approach like so. I'm just going to test here. Let's try for 5. Well, x is 5. And we'll just make sure that we're closer to the oblique asymptote here. So when I put in x is 5, I get 8 times 1 over 2. And that's 4. So when x is 5, y is 4. So we get a point. Oops, should be a little lower like that. Wipe that out. All right, and we get an idea that this graph's probably going to approach something like that. And there we go, that's fine. All right, uh, so this happens sometimes with oblique asymptotes. We end up realizing after starting to draw that we really could have centered it in a different place because this graph's going to be maybe asymmetric, skewed off to one side. Uh, but this is fine. If this happens, do you want to test? Just make sure you're showing all the things that are asked, and you're going to be fine. OK. So we're going to try. I think we can get through 12 and 13 at least before uh, calling it a video. So I have to get to the winter concert. All right. Determine the exact ratios for each of the following. To know how to do this, we've got to remember our two special triangles. We know we have a triangle 1, 2, root 3, and uh, this has an angle of pi over 6 and pi over 3. And we have this other special triangle, which is the isosceles right triangle. And that means that each of these guys have to be equivalent to each other, because angles opposite equal sides are equal. And uh, we have a 1, 1, and when we solve the Pythagorean theorem, we find this is root 2. Those are our two special triangles. This one was half of an equilateral triangle. All right, so to solve these questions, we're going to start by sketching the angle. Remember, we have these uh, angles and radians uh, that we would put on our when we're graphing in standard position. And we're going to say, OK, pi over 6. That's going to be like a sixth of our way to pi, so not very much. So it's going to be in here somewhere. And it's going to look like that. I'm going to draw a triangle to fit. And if that's pi over 6, then I actually recognize that it actually looks exactly like this triangle, pi over 6, in a right, right angle. So I'm going to put some measurements here. And then I say, OK, sine is uh, opposite over hypotenuse. So I'm going to take my opposite of 1 and my hypotenuse of 2. So therefore, sine of pi over 6 is really just 1 over 2. Now, you actually could have solved this because pi over 6 is in the first quadrant without actually drawing it in standard position. You could have just looked at the stand, the uh, and seen that uh, opposite of pi over 6 is 1 and the hypotenuse is 2, and that would have been correct. 
In fact, this is one where you actually could have used a calculator. Uh, all right, cool. So uh, the next one, we're going to sketch this guy here. And I think I'll sketch them alternatively out here and over here so that we keep some space. All right, three quarters of our way to pi from zero. This is half of pi here and pi and three halves of pi and two pi. So we're going to go almost all the way, and then we're going to stop about three quarters of the way. And the question is, well, what's our reference angle here? Well, I know that I didn't quite get to pi. That's three quarters of pi there. And there's another bit there. Now, you may be comfortable enough with fractions to recognize that if, how much of a fraction you need to go if you've got three quarters of the way, and you need to go that last leg. Uh, you could express that probably as a fraction of pi. But for other people, maybe we want to say, well, we didn't quite make it to pi, so we could write this as pi um, minus 3 quarters of pi. And then we could rewrite that as 4 pi over 4 minus 3 pi over 4, which is pi over 4. That means our reference angle here is pi over 4, and that corresponds to a special triangle, this one. Here, and we're going to have to watch out when we label up our negative uh, values, moving in the negative direction. We're going to give them negative values, otherwise, like our hypotenuses are always positive. And we're looking for the cosine, that means the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Adjacent hypotenuse. So this is going to be one, oh, pardon me, negative one over root two. That's going to be cosine of three pi over four. All right. Uh, so, I'm going to put a box around that. Now, the next one is going to be, uh, so, looks like it's a little bit more than pi. We're going four-thirds. That's bigger than one. All right, so we're going to go all the way to one. And we're going to go a bit more, but maybe we're not sure how much more. Uh, now, one the way you could write and think about this is a different way than maybe... Uh, subtracting fractions of pi, that's one method. And we could do that again. We could say, well, how much is left? If we take 4 pi over 3 and we take away pi, what do we get? And you could perform a pretty similar operation to this. However, I'm going to talk about a different way to do this one, which is to rewrite some of these values in terms of uh, a denominator of 3. So I could write this as 3 pi over 3. And I could write this one as kind of halfway, so I call that um, 1.5 pi over 3. And this would be 4.5 pi over 3. And this would be 6 pi over 3. So maybe we can think about how many thirds of pi we're counting. And we're going to go maybe 1 third of pi and 2 thirds of pi, 3 thirds of pi. And then 4 thirds of pi is going to be in between 3 thirds of pi and four and a half thirds of pi. So it's going to be down here. How much further? Well, a third of pi further. One third of pi. It's going to be pi over three. And you can't really make that out in the video, can you? I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Oops. Me... Right. Now, if you don't like that method, you can always use this method for... Uh, figuring out where we're going to be. All right, anyway, we see that this corresponds again to this triangle, so we're going to label up these sides. Uh, opposite of root 3, or pardon me, of pi over 3 is root 3, except it's going to be negative in this direction. And then we have a hypotenuse of 2. And then we're looking for the tan of this ratio, so we're going to take the opposite and divide it by the hypotenuse. So tan of 4 pi over 3 is going to be equal to negative root 3, which is the opposite over negative 1, which is the adjacent. And it's going to give us just simplify to root 3. All right, let's move on. So we've got, this is an angle that actually is on our terminal, our terminal arm is on one of our axes, 3 and a pi over 2. It's one of the ones we label every time. Okay, so what do we do if an angle lands on the axis? Well, it goes a little bit differently this way. Uh, we got to remember uh, our 
our, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Unit circle is what I was looking for. I guess that's two words. Our unit circle uh, is, has a radius of one unit. So that means this is point one zero. And this is point zero one. And this is the point negative one zero. This is a point zero, negative one. And we know that in a unit circle, if we draw out an angle, uh, the sine of any angle is going to be corresponding to the y coordinate on along the unit circle. The cosine always corresponds to the x coordinate on the unit circle, and the tan always corresponds to the y value divided by the x. And in this case, our y value is negative 1, so sine 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. Lastly, uh, we've got 11 pi over 6. Okay, so where the heck is that if we were to draw it? All right, so 11 pi over 6, uh, well, it's going to be in the fourth quadrant because it's pretty big. It's not quite more than... 12 pi over 6, which would be 6 over which would be the same as 2 pi. It's going to be a little bit less. But say we're not sure. We could do the same thing we did above, or maybe we'll just say, let's take 2 pi, and let's take away 11 pi over 6, and let's just see where we're at. Okay, well, I can rewrite 2 pi as 12 pi over 6, and 12 pi over 6 minus 11 pi over 6 is going to be pi over 6. So we're only going to be pi over 6 radians short of going all the way around the circle. So there's our terminal arm and pi over 6 in here, which means it's going to correspond to this special triangle. All right, so that's going to give us an opposite of negative 1 adjacent of root 3 and hypotenuse of 2. And if we're looking for cosine, that's the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So cosine of 11 pi over 6 is the adjacent root 3 over the hypotenuse of 2. And that's our answer. So, all right, that's the answer for C. That's the answer for A. This is the answer for E. Okay. And I think we're going to have to call it there today. I've got to head home, get some food, get out to the winter concert. All right. Well, good luck studying. Let me know if you guys have any questions about any of this.